Jean to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Our story today is Third Army, another in a special series of first-hand reports on the Continental Armies of the United States. If you have ever visited certain portions of the southeastern area of America, you have no doubt at some time seen parachutes floating to earth. You may have wondered where they came from and how men were trained in this type of duty. Well, that's just one of the many activities you'll see and hear about. Our guide on this tour of Third Army is Lieutenant John Mortimer. This is Lieutenant John Mortimer. Another chapter is about to begin in the story of our Army areas in the zone of the interior. The big picture camera truck slows down as it enters the gate at Fort McPherson, Georgia. This is headquarters of the Third Army. And it is from this post that our tour of the Third Army installations and activities will begin. We're a little early for our appointment with Lieutenant General A.R. Bowling, Commanding General of Third Army. So let's stop off in Patton Hall for a look in at a meeting of the Area Army Advisory Committee. The gentlemen on the left are Mr. Earl Cock, Jr. and Dr. Alan Albert. The other man is Mr. Richard Rich, Chairman of the Atlanta Army Advisory Committee. Would you tell us just how you function with the Army? Well, Lieutenant, the uh, Army Advisory Group uh, uh, was organized right after the last World War with the thought that in a democracy, the, the military should know more about the community in which they live and the, the citizens at large should know more about the problems of the military. And the, the group was organized for the purpose of sort of acting as a liaison, a coordinator, to integrate uh, these two groups of citizens together into the community. And I think it's a very worthy and desirable objective. I see. Now, do you function for the Army as a whole or just for Third Army? Well, we actually function for the whole uh, system of national defense, actually, uh, because we have an opportunity not only in army areas, such as the third, but throughout the nation. There are civilian aides to the secretary of the army in every state, as well as an advisory group throughout the entire army area of all army areas. Now, doctor, uh, how many advisors are there per state? Well, uh, there's an advisor for each state. In Georgia, it happens that there are two of us. Why is that? It, well, I th think that's probably because of the very large number of troops that there are in this state. It's a very, very important state from a military standpoint. I and see. we have special problems, too, which have to do very largely with the matter of community facilities, uh, the type of housing that's available, and so on, because we've moved in a lot of people in here in a very few few years. I think it's always well worth pointing out that most of us are natives of the area that we come from. My accent wouldn't reflect, reflect that, I'm sure. Well, thank you very much. Now it's time for our appointment with General Bowling, who is to tell us of Third Army's history and its mission. The Third Army was activated on November 7th, 1918 at Chaumont, France. It had occupation duty on the Rhine until it was inactivated on July 2nd, 1919. The Third Army patch, that is the white A on the blue background, signifies uh, the Army of Occupation in Germany in World War I. The Third Army was reactivated at Fort Sam Houston, Texas on October 1st, 1940 and became operational August 1st, 1944 under the command of General Patton. After VE Day, it occupied Germany, May 9, 1945 to 15 February 1947. Later, the designation of the Third Army was transferred from Germany to Atlanta, Georgia on March 14, 1947. This army had 281 days of campaign, that is from August 1, 44, to May 945, it captured over 81,000 square miles, 1,200 cities, 
over 1,280,000 prisoners and had a total number of casualties of 160,000. General Bowling has personally devised our itinerary for the high spots of his command, and we are on our way. First stop is to be in an establishment that is now in its 36th year of operation. Fort Benning, home of the infantry school. Since 1919, millions of soldiers have learned basic and advanced tactics at this place. The men we see now are in the officer candidate school. These future leaders undergo intensive training in every phase of military knowledge needed for leadership. All of them are men from the ranks who have been selected for advancement. Most of the activity at Fort Benning revolves around the infantry school. The soldier students are here to sharpen their abilities as infantrymen and to learn of the new developments in this complicated business of defense. Our big picture camera truck trundles over rough terrain to watch one of the many demonstrations which clearly illustrate the problems learned in class. Major Mansfield holds the microphone. Gentlemen, earlier this afternoon, we have discussed the methods of attack and the fundamentals that goes in having infantry and tanks work together. Now let's look at the component parts of this small but highly effective infantry tank team. We have on one side combat infantrymen. Here's a typical squad coming into position on your left. What? Pull. Order. Pull. Right. Three. Great. Two. All of you gentlemen are familiar with this rifle squad and the weapons with which they are armed. I'd like for you to note the added firepower in the present rifle squad of the extra DAR. Now the other member of this team all the tanks that you see sitting further to your left. Those five tanks are one platoon that make up the normal infantry tank team when they are attached to a rifle company. How would you, as a future rifle company commander, like to have a platoon of tanks attached to your rifle company? Do you realize that on each tank, in addition to the several machine guns, they have their normal armament, the 90 millimeter gun? Gentlemen, those tanks only fired 13 seconds. You can see the added firepower that we have within those tanks. Now, we must know how to use it to get the maximum from the capabilities that's here for our use. Now, gentlemen, this particular firing that you've seen by this tank platoon, we call saturation fire. We must realize our part that we must play as instruments to protect these tanks. There are many weapons and obstacles on the battlefield which affect the operation of these tanks to a great deal more than they do our infantry. We must serve as instruments as the eyes and ears, in many cases, for these tanks. An example of this is a tank hunter team. What is a tank hunter team? A tank hunter team is any group of infantrymen armed with a short range and a tank weapon. Here is a friendly tank hunter team going into position with a rocket launcher. Now you can see that particular team is quite effective against the lone and isolated tanks. And it is our duty and our responsibility to pick that up and destroy it for the use of our infantry weapons. I'd like for you now to move forward to the bleachers to your front to witness a demonstration which will be composed of an infantry platoon and a tank platoon in the assault of an objective. Move forward, please. Right. 
Major, while you have a free moment, will you tell us what you call this problem? This is called the infantry tank team in the assault. And uh, what is the purpose of this problem here? Well, the purpose is to show the value of having infantry and tanks together, the mutual support that can be gained from the two when placed in a team. I see. Now, has this class had any previous instruction in the infantry tank team? Well, they've had uh, technical training as far as the weapons are concerned, and they've been given classroom instructions on the tank company infantry regiment as to its tactics and organization. Now, will they participate in this problem that you have going on out here? Well, uh, not in the live firing demonstration at first, but uh, they will participate after the demonstration in a lane work, each of the individuals, members of the class, serving as a infantry platoon leader, working with a section of tanks. Well, that's a lot of firepower that we witnessed there earlier in your demonstration. Absolutely, and all of that that you did witness and will witness is real live ammunition, giving as much training as we can uh, to these men. The real thing, in other words. That's correct. Well, I see your class is ready. Thank you very much, right. sir. Right. Thanks for coming in. We are now in the forward position for the purpose of witnessing the demonstration between the, of the infantry tank team. You imagine yourself as being in the zone of the attacking battalion. This particular company's zone of action that you're in has a platoon of tanks attached to it. Your zone that will take place immediately to your front. We have a tremendous amount of firepower at the command of this rifle company commander. He will use all of this that he possibly can pay attention to his fire support plan. concludes our demonstration. The troops for this afternoon were furnished by Abel Company of the 30th Infantry and Dog Company of the 30th Infantry. The tanks were from the 550th Tank Company. Now, if you will, thank you. If you will move right out to your lane work. Move out, please. And we were on our way, too. Our destination, Camp Gordon, near Augusta, Georgia. At the Provost Marshal General Center, military police trainees receive instruction in traffic control. We are seeing how a trainee is put through his paces here at Traffic City. Intensive drilling in traffic control signals helps the trainee to develop confidence, proper body stance, and clear, sharp hand and arm movements. These are necessary to a smooth, authoritative performance in guiding heavy traffic. The Criminal Investigation Laboratory is the only military criminal lab in the zone of the interior. Lieutenant Colonel Tolkien is the officer in charge here at the Criminal Investigation Laboratory. Colonel, I see you have two tests going on here. What uh, is this first one? Uh, this man here is now determining whether a narcotic or one of the barbiturates is present in evidence submitted by a field investigating detachment. We have many tests of this type being performed at all times. And the second test, uh, I see some GI socks. Oh, yeah, this is a uh, case that is rather peculiar. It uh, was uh, sent in to us from a uh, storage depot in the Alaskan Command, and these uh, Army socks were subjected to a fire of unknown origin. It is up to us to determine, if possible, the cause of that fire. Then you're going to sort of recreate the fire. Uh, yes, <laughs> this uh, test that is now being conducted is to determine the uh, ignition temperature point. And uh, from that, we can determine whether the article itself is of a combustible nature or whether it was intentionally set. And uh, we hope to be of an assistance in the solution of this case before we are through. Well, that's very interesting, Colonel. Thank you for talking to the big picture I'm camera. I'm very glad to have been able to assist you. Bye now. Another important activity at Camp Gordon is the training of communication specialists who study at the Signal Corps Training Center. This small group is inspecting a modern tool of a soldier called Radiac, a supersensitive instrument used to detect and compute radioactive particles present after an atomic explosion. An interesting spectacle is the pole orchard. 
A game of catch is useful in teaching these linemen trainees to become free and easy while perched at the top of a telephone pole. As for getting down in a hurry, training by closed circuit television transmission is another feature of the Southeastern Signal School. We're going to visit one of the classrooms which use this electronic teaching miracle and learn more about it from Lieutenant Colonel White. Carry a repeater system. With the switch down in DC line position, then your magnet Colonel, if we'll step back, I'd like to have you tell our big picture audience just about this broad horizon TV classroom here. Certainly, Lieutenant. Here in the Southeastern Signal School, for some time we have been conducting experiments in the use of television as an aid to military instruction. We have progressed to the point where a number of hours of instruction are given during the regular courses here in the school. We find that we are able to bring to the attention of the students, all of the students, not merely those in the front row, the various intricate, small, and complicated parts which are used in various items of signal equipment. Was this something that is going to be Army-wide someday, Colonel? We expect that it will, Lieutenant. We're quite confident that it will in the future. That's a great uh, field. We it think really so. It can help instruction. It has been a great help to us thus far, and we expect that it will become even better. Thank you very much, sir. Not at all. We'll be heading north now, on our way to a point 50 miles below the state capital of North Carolina, to Fort Bragg, home of the famed 18th Airborne Corps. But before seeing the big show, we're going to stop by to see a bit of a little known activity, the Army Psychological Warfare Center. Lieutenant Marty Moore here, who is chief of the leaflet section, knows a lot about psychological warfare. Lieutenant, how would you sum up Psy War? Sum it up? Well, I would say that psychological warfare is the actual dissemination of facts to the enemy with the intention of mind of lowering his morale, of his emotions, or his ability to fight. That's quite a mission. Yes, that's one of the toughest jobs in psychological warfare, in actually convincing the enemy soldier or the civilian that we are telling him the truth. You know, if the enemy ever caught us in telling him a big lie, then we would actually be in a bad shape for psychological warfare. If he ever did catch us, all of the work done by the men here in this section and the linguists, the propagandists, all throughout the group would be done in vain. Yes, with us in psychological warfare, the big lie technique is completely out. Well, do you have a outside unit or a mobile unit that yes, spreads us? Yes, would you like to go down now and watch our uh, LNL team work out? Certainly would. A short walk, and we're at the site of the field unit. See the jeep over there? Listen. Gee, 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 gee. What is he saying? Attention, attention. Soldiers of the Chinese Communist Army, this is the voice of United Nations. This is the voice of the peoples of peace. Soon, you will have no more food. It is senseless to continue fighting. Use your safe conduct passes. Come over to United Nations lines. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. You're more than welcome, Lieutenant Mortimer. Perhaps the most exciting outfit at Fort Bragg is the 18th Airborne Corps. That's Major General Cleland. Major General Farrell, Brigadier General Walker, and Brigadier General Daniel. They're going to lead their units in a practice jump. And with just a little persuasion, we might get them to let the big picture camera crew go along. It was suggested that we become temporary members of the 18th and participate. And before he can change his mind, your guide is being strapped in a parachute. While the plane is loaded, I'm trying to remember all I ever knew about the proper method of making a jump. Because after that door closed, there was no way to get back to the ground again, except by the same route as all the others. During the flight, I sit next to General Cleland, who wears the wings of a master jumper. He briefs me on what was to come, and we are going to jump from a medium altitude, 1,800 feet. The pilots fly to our target area, and from then on, things happen in a hurry. The general is first out of the plane, and I'm right after him. And this is the way the ground looks from an altitude of less than a third of a mile. 
The general shouts instructions to me as we led a long line of chutes. Then we make our landings. Watch the way the general made his. In a few moments, we are picked up and taken to the collection point. And I must say that your guide is having one of the big thrills of his army career. Let me take this microphone, General. How was it? How'd I do for an amateur, sir? You uh, look like a veteran trooper coming out the door there. Well, it was quite an experience. Well, it was uh, mighty fine that you could go along with us and uh, remarkable that you could make that exit on the second jump as well as you did. Thank you, sir. I noticed that you uh, came down standing up, sir. That's right. That was my uh, 67th jump and the first time I've made a standing landing. A first time? First time. Oh, that's quite wonderful. Who uh, were the rest of the people who were jumping with us today? Well, these are all our good chaplains from all the airborne units here at Bragg. Uh, every denomination. Uh, these chaplains uh, jump with the men constantly. They're always with them. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. It was quite an experience, sir. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Right, sir. No charge. Hey. <laughs> We leave Fort Bragg and head for Alabama and an installation which started as an artillery range and grew into what has been called a military show place. Fort McClellan is our destination. This post is the home of the Chemical Corps School, which provides instruction in chemical warfare theories and techniques to students from all branches of the armed forces and to military personnel from friendly foreign nations. Much of the work here is done in the field, where the Chemical Corps School conducts many kinds of experiments and practice problems. We are in time to witness one of them. In this case, clouds of smoke create a situation for a decontamination exercise. Carrying spray guns and other equipment, the students pierce the smoke-filled field and start their operations. This particular problem is to free equipment from dangerous chemicals or gases. Wearing their special clothing, these men look as though they came from a planet from out of space. Let's find out a little more about these men in their mysterious garb. What is the purpose of the smoke, Lieutenant? Uh, the smoke, in this case, is used to simulate a CBR attack. Uh, usually we put mild chemical irritants in it to make the decontamination personnel realize the situation is here. Today, however, there are none of those chemical irritants in the smoke. Well, I thought as much being out here without any mask on or one of these protective garbs. Now, you mentioned CBR agents. What are they? Well, CBR agents are chemical, biological, and radiological agents used in warfare. What are these suits made out of, these special uniforms like? The uniform that I have on here is an impermeable uniform. It's made of butyl rubber. It protects us from harmful chemical and biological agents by keeping them out or excluding them from our body. And uh, there's another uniform that we have that you see here. This is what we call combat protective clothing. This clothing has put into it certain chemicals which tend to neutralize chemical agents and tends to kill some biological agents. Now, the uniform that the combat soldier wears is not as good a uniform, doesn't give as good a protection as does the uniform I'm wearing here. But uh, it is a good uniform. An infantryman can conduct his mission, can go ahead and affect his mission while wearing these clothing. Well, do you ever use the real thing, the real gases uh, uh, in yes. this training? We surely do. We use very realistic training here. At the beginning of this exercise, or just prior to the beginning, we place contamination, CBR contamination, on this equipment. I see. And so these personnel are actually doing decontamination as we would do it, as we'd find contaminated equipment in the field. Well, thank you very much, Lieutenant. Very right. interesting. Thank you very much. We leave Fort McClellan and travel to our last stop in the 3rd Army area, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. On blanking signs at the impressive entrance to the leader's school, one reads of the infantryman's mission. And his motto on the other side. Our first stop is to watch a group in the infantry leader's course faced with the problem of fording a stream, burying a wounded buddy. 
a medical corps man gives him advice and encouragement of a sort. Okay, okay, you get him in and die before you get him across. What are you waiting for? Why are you wearing the jam, huh? Come on! Boy, I'm so glad I'm not in this shoot under pin on lifesavers like you! Come on, head over there! That extra tough talk is premeditated. The hazing received in exercises like this is the supreme test of potential leader's ability to keep his head under the most trying circumstances and conditions. All the techniques adapted to foot soldiering from time immemorial are taught here at Fort Jackson. On this field, effective concealment practices are demonstrated for trainees and to some of them, it's entertaining as well as instructive. Camouflage of equipment, not only from ground observance, but from the air as well, is another phase of knowledge imparted to these new soldiers who have only just begun their military service. And as these men begin their training as soldiers on a huge post in South Carolina, named for one of America's great historical figures, Andrew Jackson, the big picture camera ends this tour of the Third Army area. We've traveled hundreds of miles through the southeastern United States to bring you the highlights. Now our direction is to the westward. This is Lieutenant John Mortimer inviting you to come along with us again next week when we visit San Antonio, Texas and begin our tour of Fourth Army. That's the story of Third Army, another in a special series of guided tours through the Continental Armies of America. Next week, Lieutenant John Mortimer will again be our escort when we'll be traveling through the area of Fourth Army. The marked contrast between the Army of today, which employs weapons such as guided missiles, and that of a century ago can be clearly seen when we visit many historic relics of America's westward expansion. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to tune in again next week for another look at your army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of The Big Picture you can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.